All right, getting really close. We're in the week of atonement, we call it. Um, and uh, moving through uh, some of that, of course, some of this, I'm going to have to get us forward a little bit, but, uh, but we'll, um, quite a discourse here Jesus has before, uh, before he really getting really close to his crucifixion here. And this discourse that he has, he um, speaks here in a lot of parables, and we talked about quite a few of them last time. We talked about the uh, um, idea of, this, of the growers and the vineyard, this idea of the wicked husband coming in, talked about that last week. Um, we get into this marriage, and a lot of times Jesus talks about marriage, uses that illustration or that parallel when he talks about the kingdom, because, because we are, the church is married to Christ, and, and God really, uh, Israel was married to God, and of course, God divorced them, you know, God, because of Israel's adultery and what Israel did, but the church is married to God, so marriage is a real illustration that Jesus used, and Paul uses that also, so so it's an illustration that we see uh, this idea of marriage because marriage is covenant, right? Marriage is covenant. That's what it is. And, and it's no different uh, than a covenant we make when we join ourselves to another person and we marry that person. We, we make a covenant with them, don't we? we? We vow to do certain things, to be a certain type of person, to hold them in a certain respect within our lives. And it's the same way with God. We covenant with God. We agree to be in a relationship with him. We agree that we're going to be a certain kind of person and that he's going to fulfill and be the God that he says he's going to be, that he's going to do what he says. Um, and that's a covenant relationship. And covenant relationships are different in the Bible than promises. And sometimes we have a hard time maybe distinguishing those differences but a promise that God makes is kind of irrevocable. Um, it's not something that can ever change. What God promises is always promised. The really good illustration of that is probably uh, when God promised Abraham the land of Canaan and that he would take those people, he would take his descendants, he would give them Canaan's land across the Jordan. That was a promise that God made. It wasn't a covenant. God promised Abraham to do that. In an exodus, when the children of Israel, you know the story, they make the golden calf and Moses comes down from the mountain and tears up the tablets and, and God basically comes to Israel and he says, uh, and he says I'm not going to go with you, right? But he says, I'm going to send my angel to drive out the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and I'm going to give you the land that I told Abraham I'd give him, but I'm not going because I will destroy you along the way. Now we know Moses you know, interceded for Israel, and God relented, and God remade the tablets. But, but basically, it's a really good illustration of God. God says, I promised Abraham this land, and I'm going to give it to him, his descendants. Regardless of what his descendants do, I'm going to give him the land, because I promised the land, promised it to him. And even though Israel broke the covenant that they had just made with God before Moses went up on the mountain because they had just made a covenant with God and Moses sprinkled them with blood and they said, you know, and God said, I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people, take you to this land, I will do what you say, we're going to do what you say. They make the golden calf, they break the covenant when they do that. So the covenant's broken, God says, I don't have to go with you anymore, I'm not going to go with you anymore. But because of the promise I made to Abraham, I'm going to give you that promise. And why is that so important to us? Because God promises heaven, right? I mean, that's really the promise of the Bible is eternal life. That's what God promises. And God's not going to take away that promise. Now, we can fall out of covenant and we can lose heaven. We can never make a covenant and we cannot go to heaven. But it doesn't change the fact that heaven is a promise God made and it's going to be there for those that are obedient to what he says to do. Promises aren't broken. Covenants, on the other hand, can be broken. Because a covenant is no different in a marriage, no different in a relationship with God. Covenants require two parties. Covenants require us to agree and to fulfill, just like a contract, certain obligations to one another. So when we start to talk, and that's the reason I think God often uses marriage. Jesus Christ often uses marriage in parables in, because it illustrates the point of our relationship to God. And this is a parable, of course, but we understand that the parable itself it's just a parallel to 
the kingdom and to what Christ is trying to say. It says, the kingdom of heaven, he compared to a king, gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. And he sent out other slaves. So the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So who's the king here? God, right? And who's the son? Christ, right? So he made a, so he did this kingdom for his son. And so what did he do? So he sent out slaves to call the, all those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. So he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fat and livestock are all butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention, went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. The rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, killed them. The king was enraged. And he sent his armies to destroy those murders and set their city on fire. So who, so who are the ones he sent out? The prophets. Everybody that came out for the words, sent them out, right? Sent out the apostles, sent out all these people. Said the wedding feast is ready, right? Come to the wedding feast, but they won't do it, right? And because of that, he's going, there's going to be judgment for that. All right, there's going to be judgment for that. But then he said to his slaves, the wedding feast is ready. So go to the main highways, as many as you find there, invite them to the wedding feast. The slaves went out into the streets, gathered together all they found, evil or good. The wedding hall was filled. And when the king, okay, so now he sends them out. So who are the ones that he goes out to find, the original ones that weren't invited? Who are those? All of us, right? Everybody. The Gentiles. Goes out to everybody. Goes out to the Gentiles, to us. Says, come to the wedding feast, right? It's all prepared. Come to the wedding feast. But it's interesting here. So he says he invited in the sinners and the righteous, right? Invited in the good and the bad, right? So he invited everybody. Everybody has an invitation. So what, does that, so what does that mean? Does that mean everybody can go, right? Everybody's invited, right? Everybody's invited. Nobody's excluded. Everybody can go. But then what happened? He saw a man there was not dressed in wedding clothes, and he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. And the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, throw him out in the outer darkness, and that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what's he said? He said, You had to be prepared to go to the wedding. Isn't that what that means? You had to be dressed. You had to be prepared to go to the wedding didn't you? You're all invited. Everybody can come in. Bring them all in, right? But if you're not prepared for it, then you're going to be thrown out. You know, it's very, very similar to, you know, the parable of the wheat and the tares. You remember that, right? Let them all grow together. The harvest will separate them, right? Same type, basic principle. He says, many are called, but few are chosen. You know, he's, it's a real good illustration of, of the kingdom. We all have the invitation. Everybody can go. But if you're not dressed, if you're not prepared to go, then you're not going to be allowed to stay, you see. And that's the illustration. And Jesus, of course, using this to say, I'm going to turn away from the Jews. Because why? Because they're no longer faithful to me, see. They're no longer who they need to be. So we see that illustration a lot in Scripture. Are there any comments? You know, governments and religion, <laughs> it's always been a problem, isn't it? <laughs> Still is, <laughs> right? Um, you know, probably no more so than the, than the Jews and the Romans. Um, they were at odds. Uh, Romans were uh, Jews didn't want to be under Roman rule. Yeah, Ray. Well, they weren't prepared. You know, I mean, you got to be prepared to go into God's kingdom. You know, you got to be one of His children. You got to be ready to go. You have to be prepared is the best way I know to say it. He wasn't dressed to be there, so they threw him out. They were all invited in. The good, the bad, everybody was invited in, but only those who were dressed were allowed to stay prepared. It's an illustration for us. Jesus Christ, he, everybody can go to heaven. Everybody's invited, right? But the Bible's pretty plain that most won't go, right? Wide is the way that leads to destruction. 
right? Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. Few there be that find it, right? The ones that aren't dressed, the ones that aren't prepared to go, that aren't obedient to Christ, are going to get thrown out. So you have to be prepared. That's the best, you know. And doesn't Jesus teach that over and over and over, right? Uh, the virgins, right? Parable of the virgins, the lamps, the ones that had their oil, the others didn't, right? Who could go in? The ones that had their oil, the other ones couldn't go in. You know, so I mean, it's a real theme of Jesus. You know, you got to be prepared to go, right? Um, you don't know what hour he might come, be prepared, right? Any time to meet him because you never know what hour he'll come. If you'd known what hour the thief was breaking in, you would have been ready, right? But you didn't know. Be prepared over and over in the Bible. That's the theme of Scripture, right? Be prepared. Um, right. We've got to be clothed with obedience. Confession, baptism, uh, you know, obedience to the gospel is what clothes us, makes us ready to uh, be, part of that, be part of that feast. You know, but the Romans and the Jews, they uh, were at odds, of course. The Jews thought Roman oppression was wrong. If you've ever really seen anything of Rome or ever been over there, they were real big on images, Roman images, Caesars, uh, busts of the Caesars in towns, images of Caesars on the coins. We do the same thing, don't we? We put images, images on coins, right? But... You got to remember on the Ten Commandments, you know, there's one thing that said, don't have any graven images, right? Any graven images. Um, so they considered of these to be images, graven images, and the, what was on the coin was a graven image. And that's why you couldn't use Roman money in the temple. You had to use drachma in the temple. Drachma was temple money, Jewish money. And you couldn't use Roman money in the temple because it had a graven image. It was Roman money. That's how come Jesus, he threw the money, cha money tables changers over. That's what they were doing. They were changing currency to temple money because you had to pay your, remember when they went to Jesus and they wanted the two drachma tax, you know, and, and Peter goes and catches the fish and there's two drachma, right? Um, that was temple money. You know, it, he couldn't, it wasn't that amazing miracle. He caught the fish and it had to be the right kind of money, right? It couldn't be any money. It had to be the right kind of money, right? Because you had to have that and every male was required to pay care uh, English is my first language I promise every male was required to pay temple tax right and it had to be dropped me so that's why they changed money in the temple that's why you had to change money and of course people came from other places than Rome other areas of the world and you had to exchange that money that's why Jesus did that but this is a tax to Caesar it's one thing to be under another you know, to be under their rule, but then you got to pay tax. Well, should we have to pay tax is the question here. And you got to remember, you know, we're very American, I guess, all of us in here. And, you know, we all grew up paying taxes, and, and that's got more oppressive over the course of my life. But, um, you know, we all grew up doing that, but we're all kind of Americans, and we all kind of just do our little thing. But you got to remember that, that Jews didn't consider themselves Romans. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, they didn't consider themselves to be Romans. So for them to pay a tax to a government that the basically they didn't consider themselves to be a part of was a, a different deal, right? That was different. Just because you lived in Rome, right, so to speak, in the Roman Empire, didn't make you Roman. You get that in the Bible, right? Remember Paul and his discussion? And Paul says, uh, I'm a Roman citizen. And the centurion said, I obtained that at great cost. And Paul says, I was born, right? I was born a Roman. So to be a Roman citizen carried certain advantages. And not everybody, just because Rome, you were in Roman land or the Roman Empire, it didn't make you a Roman citizen. If you remember right, or if you ever knew that, I guess, Peter was crucified in Rome by Nero, right? Paul was beheaded by Rome and Nero because Peter wasn't a Roman. And Ro Ro non-Romans were crucified. Jesus was crucified because Peter wasn't a Roman. Paul was beheaded because if you were Roman, you got to get beheaded, which I guess is better. <laughs> okay? So, so there was a difference. And so you got to remember it's a different mindset. You're living in a different... It's be like you going to... 
Italy or somewhere and then having to pay tax to the Italians, even though you're American. You know, you would not feel like maybe that was your duty because you weren't a citizen of that country. I don't know exactly even how that works, but, but you wouldn't feel it was your duty. So this is kind of the case. The Pharisees plotted, right? Um, and in this, is interesting, in, in Mark, if you only get this in Mark, I think, but in Mark, uh, it says the Herodians were with him. Who are the Herodians? Yeah, followers of Herod, right? Loyal, those loyal to Herod. Now, at this time, that wouldn't be Herod the Great, because Herod the Great, that was dead. But uh, there is Herod Agrippa and Herod Antipas, so... It's a, they're the well, the Herod or the dynasty of Herod, I guess you might say. And it says, uh, they came and said to him, teach, we know you're truthful, defer, not partial. Teach correctly. Um, you are truthful. Teach the way of God and truth. So they kind of butter him up. That's what you do when you're going to trap somebody. You kind of butter him up to start with. He says, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar? Uh, what's poll tax? We've had those in those countries before, in this country before, right? What does it mean? What's a poll tax? What kind of taxes do we have? What kind of taxes did they have in Rome, do you think? Roman taxes. We had a lot of tax collectors, right? Nicodemus was a, I mean, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. I always get them two mixed up. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, right? Matthew was a tax collector. Tax collectors were hated. A Jewish tax collector wasn't allowed in the temple. They were considered unclean. Um, tax collectors were known to be brutal. They were known to be dishonest. They were, uh, took extra on the top. They, uh, if you remember right, Matthew was called out of a tax booth, right? Matthew was called out of a tax booth, right? Um, so... In this country, what was a poll tax? Come on. <laughs> That's it. They made that illegal, right? We don't do that anymore. You used to have to pay a poll tax to vote, right? That was a poll tax. It's a tax that allowed you to vote. Um, they're not legal anymore. You can't do that. But it did occur in this country. There was a time we had those. So... Um, it's a it's a tax that makes you where you can vote. So you're not a Roman citizen, right? You don't have any legal rights, but you pay this poll tax. Uh, it allows you to vote. So there's all kinds of taxes, right? Romans had a lot of roads. These booths were set up on the road. Some of these, I'm sure, were were what we might consider a turnpike fee, you know? Because they didn't have easy pass in those days. You had to pay, you know? Uh, some of the, I'm sure there was a lot of taxes we don't know about. But, um, but taxes were taxes, right? And we've always kind of taxed things the same way throughout history. Poll taxes, right? Road taxes, excise, or, you know, import taxes, right? Things like that. So, um, so we've always kind of done that. Um, interestingly, you know, we haven't always had an income tax in this country, right? That would be nice, right? And when they first started, it was only 1%. You know that? It was 1%. Yeah. So uh, taxes tend to increase over time, as they have here and in my lifetime. And taxes can be oppressive. We know that. And they were very oppressive to these people. And he says, it's lawful to pay a poll tax. He detected their trickery. He says, show me a denarius. A denarius is about a day's wage at the time of Christ. Um, they brought him one. He says, show me the coin used for the poll tax. So this poll tax was a day's wage. That kind of gives you an idea of oppressive tax, right? I mean, that's a whole day's wage, right? Um, I don't know how many hours a day we work for the government. Does anybody know that statistically? I don't, I don't know what that is. It would, it's not good. <laughs> but anyway, but it was a whole day's wage. And he said to them, his likeness is on this. And they said, Caesar's. And so Jesus said, render unto Caesar's the things that are Caesar's, unto God the things that are God's. So he kind of avoided the question, didn't he? Should we pay it? Well, yeah. Give Caesar what Caesar's, right? And we use that illustration a lot. Uh, but also give to God what is God's. Um, so he kind of 
skirted the question a little bit, didn't he? Uh, what was the right thing to do, the wrong thing to do? Um, but I think it's interesting. Um, and we, I don't know, you see a lot of that kind of in religion today, I think, in countries and religion and taxes, kind of an interesting idea. So should so churches pay tax? I'll just throw that out there. I just like to play devil's advocate today. So should we? So do you think churches should pay tax? We don't. Churches are tax exempt, right, in the United States, or can be, choose to be, um, right? He said, "Render under Caesar's what Caesar's," right? So you do think we should? So you think churches should pay tax? How come? So we don't, because it's legal, right? Legally, we don't have to pay tax, right? Is legal always ethical? <laughs> well, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, right? I think, well, maybe I'll just be quiet. I think I'll be quiet. I think we'll move on. But... We do pay our tax. We're taxed on top of tax, right? Right. That's right. That money's already been taxed once, right? But, of course, in this country, money gets taxed over and over and over again. Right? Well, we don't pay sales tax. Yeah, I think that and we don't pay property tax. So churches are, are not taxed. Now, the employees' churches pay are taxed. And interestingly, I don't know if you ever anybody knows this or not, but interestingly, uh, ministers and are considered self-employed by the government as a, as a church. So church doesn't pay um, Social Security tax and all employer. Churches don't pay employee tax on their employees. Ministers are responsible for all that tax. So considered self-employed. So, um, yeah, there's certain taxes involved uh, with that, I'm sure, that we're not exempt from. But um, churches definitely work under a different tax code in the United States. Just, I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there, just playing devil's advocate a little bit this morning. But... Um, so we do do that, you know, but that's what he said. And so hearing this, they were amazed, and they went away. And on that day, some Sadducees, um, interesting, I like the parenthetical, you know. <laughs> it's interesting in translation when there's parentheses because there's no, there's no parentheses in Greek. So, <laughs> so, it's, uh, so it's one of those translation things, right? But I always think it's kind of interesting when I see these parenthetical statements. But he would say there's no resurrection, um, and all three Gospels say that. They could, so the, so we talk about the Pharisees and the Rhodians to start with. Now, the Pharisees believe in the resurrection and angels and all that stuff. The Sadducees don't believe in that. And they were with the Herodians. But now the Sadducees come in. The Sadducees are a lot stricter than the Pharisees. Most of the Sanhedrin is made up of Sadducees, right? And the high priests were Sadducees. Well, Annas and Caiaphas, was, that's a whole other story. But they were Sadducees. So the Sadducees were a lot stricter sect of Jews than the Pharisees were. And so now the Sadducees are going to question him. And they say, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife is childless, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. Now the reason the Sadducees bring this question up is because they don't believe in the resurrection right? They don't believe in the resurrection. And because they don't believe in the resurrection, they, they're going to ask him a resurrection question to say, okay, so if, how do I say this? So they're going to ask this question to say, so if you really believe in the resurrection, then how on earth would this ever work? In other words, you know, we don't believe in the resurrection, but if you do, then how does this work? So the man dies, right? And under the law, and the reason that Moses did that, the reason God did that is because God wanted to preserve their inheritance, okay? God says, I'm going to give you this land, and I'm going to give everybody a piece of land, right? 
And God really wanted to preserve the inheritance of that person, the inheritance of the family. So what God did was, is he kind of put this in place that said, okay, if your brother dies, um, because land under Judaism went on the male line, Naomi and Ruth, right? What a good example of that, right? Um, she couldn't inherit the land of her husband because her husband was dead. But once, right, but once Ruth got married, right, then she could get that inheritance because then there was considered, so to speak, was a male heir. So it always went down the male lineage. So if all the men died or there was no male lineage, then the land, they would lose that inheritance of land. So God put this kind of in place, which seems kind of odd to you and me because we live in a different time, but it wasn't odd to them. And he said that if your brother dies... The next of kin shall marry <coughs> and raise up children for his brother. Remember in the story of Naomi and Ruth, right? And Boaz goes, and he has to go to the city gate. Remember that story? He has to go to the city gate, and he has to go to the one that would be next in kin. Remember that? And say, here she is. If you want to marry her, you can marry her, right? But if you choose not to do it, because you're next in line. And that will give her the inheritance of the family. You're, that's your responsibility under the law of Moses to do that. But if you choose not to do it, then I will do it. Remember that story? And he gave him his sandal. I don't exactly know what that means, but he gave him his sandal, right? And he married her so she would have that inheritance. So basically it's a real biblical Old Testament principle. And the Sadducees are bringing this up. It says, <coughs> she'll raise up children uh, to his brother. Because of that, once he w she would have a male heir, then that male heir would assume that inheritance of the father, and they would not lose that land possession. So that's the reason God put that in place. So the Sadducees are using this, and then they make it a real hypothetical. We love to do that, don't we? We love to do that. I have people ask me questions like that all the time. If you were on a deserted island and there was nobody there but you and you come to the truth of the gospel, could you baptize yourself? I mean, we love hypothetical questions, right? Uh, because we, we sometimes we think that way. I know there's all kinds of odd questions like that, trust me. I could go on and on. But so there's all kinds of hypothetical questions. And that's what they're doing here. So in this case, there's seven brothers. The first married and died, having no children, left his wife to his brother, second, the third, down to the seventh, right? So all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died also, okay? So seven brothers, each of them married her. The woman never had any children, and the children died. Or she died. This is a very hypothetical situation. So it sounds really bad. So all this goes on. And now they're going to give him a question. And I believe I'm missing a slide right here. I know I am. So you'll have to go to your Bible or I'll read it to you. But um, I don't know why I'm missing that slide. I noticed that last night, but I couldn't fix it. Matthew 25. Matthew 22. So all of them do that, and there's no, and there's no heir, and she dies also. So when we get down to Matthew 22, verse 27. Last of all, the woman died, and in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they had all married her. And Jesus said to them, you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. So what does he tell them? He says, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. 
We use this passage a lot. It's one of those little glimpses we get into, into heaven that we don't get many of. It's like a little bitty window. You get a view into heaven. And basically it says that in heaven we won't be married, right? I don't exactly know how that works. People always ask me those questions. I don't know, right? People always ask me, are you going to know people in heaven? Yeah, I think you will, right? But I don't think we're going to have the same desires and the same mentality in heaven that we have here. I just don't believe we will. And so God basically, Jesus basically says, you just don't understand. You don't understand what it's, the next life's going to be like. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection anyway. This was a question to trick Jesus because they were trying to make it be like, well, how would that work in the resurrection? How would you make that work? You know, that can't work, so there can't be a resurrection. And Jesus says, but you don't understand. He says it's not going to be like that. But he also really makes a statement that's probably more puzzling than maybe the marriage thing. And that's that he says, we'll be like the angels in heaven. Right? So angels, according to this passage, right, which angels are created beings by God, and angels don't apparently have that. Now, angels in the Bible, although not in our art or our uh, tradition, but angels in the Bible are all male, right? Always male gender, angels in Scripture, always. There's no example in Scripture of a female angel, and I don't think angels are male or female myself, but they're always represented in a male gender, not a neuter gender, not a female gender. They're always represented in a male gender, right? And there's no baby angels in the Bible. Just throwing that out there, right? Um, you know, so I don't know exactly how that works, but Jesus is kind of giving us a little glimpse into, into heaven. It's not going to be like that. You don't understand. But the other thing he says that's really interesting is he says, you know, in Exodus 3, when, when uh, Moses approaches the burning bush, the angel of the Lord speaks to Moses out of the burning bush, Exodus 3, 15. And he says to Moses, he says, uh, he says, I'm the I am, right? One of those really profound biblical statements, I am. And Jesus says the same thing in the Gospels when he's talking to the Pharisees, right? He says, I am. And they get so mad at him about that because they understand the, what Jesus is saying here, I am, the same I am. And so when Jesus, when God says that to Moses, what I think is really interesting because, you know, they've been in bondage for 300 years. And they probably think God's forgotten them. And they probably think, well, that's the God of Abraham, the God of our forefathers. And when God comes to him, Moses says, who do I say sent me? And he says, the I am. I am the God. I am the God of you. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I'm, I, am the, I am the God of you too. And, and I'm not, uh, I was God, and I'm not the I'm going to be God, but I'm the I am God. And I still am the I am God. And so when he, when he says that, he says, because of that, he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not that I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob no longer exist. They're talking to him about the resurrection, right? Ain't that the question? Ain't that really what they're asking? How's it going to be in the resurrection? Is there life after this? Is there eternal life after this? And Jesus says, you don't understand. He says, I'm the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. You see? That's pretty profound, I think. I mean, maybe y'all don't get that, but that seems pretty profound to me that God would say that. And so he says, they're still alive. He says, you don't understand that God's the God of the living and that these Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still live. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's pretty profound, I think, that idea. You know, the Bible, you know, we talk about that, don't we? When Lazarus, we've talked about that story a lot lately, it seems like. Rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus dies, he goes to, where does he go? Abraham's bosom, right? Um, looked at last week, looked at 1 Peter 3, 21. It says, Jesus, right in the spirit, went and preached to those who were once disobedient in the days of Noah, right? He says, in the spirit, right? He went and preached to those who were once disobedient in the days of Noah. 
So, like Jesus is answering, answering their question. They don't believe in the resurrection. Jesus says, well, do they not believe in the bodily resurrection? Do they not believe in the, do they not believe in the eternity of the soul? You know, I think that's a, you know, I, I think sometimes we get that a little bit confused, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know that they believed in the eternity of the soul, the Sadducees. I mean, I really don't think they did. I think that's my opinion. We really don't know because what we know about the Sadducees, we, there's no longer any Sadducees. We can't ask them the question. But I don't believe they believed in life, period. But I certainly didn't believe in a bodily resurrection. And it's, I think it's interesting in Scripture when you talk about resurrection, especially before Jesus was raised. We're talking about Gospels here. I think it's really interesting. We're like, well, what does that mean? You know, technically, I don't think your soul can be resurrected because your soul never dies. So how do you resurrect something that never dies, right? But if you're talking about the body, the resurrection of the body, which is what Paul talks about, what Jesus, what we'll talk about this morning in our sermon when we talk about Jesus, bodily resurrection, the body can be resurrected. Now, to me, if you're talking about the soul, it seems a mute point because you can't resurrect something that never dies. And for the soul to be resurrected, it would have to mean the soul dies. And I don't think the Bible teaches that the soul ever dies. But I think here they're talking about, so it's always been a kind of a question, I guess. So what are they talking about here? But I think you've got to be talking about bodily resurrection. In the resurrection, who are they, they going to be? Who's it going to be? Because Paul really refers to the resurrection as bodily resurrection, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4. You know, Paul always is about the bodily resurrection because you can't resurrect a soul. The soul's already alive. So I think in this case, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about bodily resurrection, right? Uh, well, we're going to change for sure. <coughs> so, I mean, some people think, well, people who believe in, like, soul, in, in soul sleep necessarily they might kind of maybe make application of that, but I really don't know how you would do that for sure. But to me, when you talk about resurrection in the body, you're not talking about the waking of the soul. You're talking about the resurrection of the body. And Paul says that will happen, right? Jesus was bodily resurrected. The soul never died, right? We talked about that in, on our sermon last Sunday. The soul of Jesus never died. The soul went to the Hadean realm, went to the realm and that's where he preached to those who are disobedient. And in Ephesians 4, that's where he took that host of captives. The soul of Jesus always existed, right? The body of Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And when Jesus was resurrected, like we talked about, what did Mary say? She says, don't, he says, don't cling to me for I've not yet ascended, right? His body would ascend, right? Forty days later, his body would ascend. And his, that's the type of our resurrection. So, um, I think we're talking about bodily resurrection here. <coughs> there any comments? Right. Right. <laughs> I'm going to look way better. Just throwing that out there. I'm going to lose at least, I'm going to lose at least 15 pounds in 20 years. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> But yeah, you're right. That's what Paul says for Thessalonians 4, right? He says he's going to bring with them those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. That's their souls, right? And then their body will be raised, right? Paul says in the moment of the twinkling of the eye at the last trump, right, the body be raised imperishable, right, and we shall be forever with the Lord. So, all right, thanks for your time this morning. <laughs>